The anti-globalization movement, or the global justice movement, can be theorized as the opposition of multinational corporations having undiluted power in the global economy. This power can be categorized through unregulated political power, trade agreements, and or unregulated financial markets used by these powerful firms in an unethical way in order to maximize their profits. Anti-globalization is defined as the removal of barriers between national borders to facilitate the flow of goods, capital, services, and labor, all of which benefit corporations along with the fraction of the population that inhabit the world while damaging the environment, indigenous people, and systematically allowing for the exploitation of the already oppressed people of developing countries. The anti-globalization movement takes notice of this and directly opposes capitalism seeking to rid the world of the injustices caused by giant corporations. They justify their action that policies that promote globalization have created sweatshop working conditions in the developing world, threatened humanized jobs and environmental protections in the global north, benefited the wealthy at the expense of the poor, and endangered ind indigenous cultures. Mostly teenagers from the countryside, 17, 18-year-olds far away from very poor homes. So this is home. They live in a dorm with seven strangers, spend six days a week repeating the same task again and again. Fatigue and boredom are common in any factory, but this one is surrounded by suicide nets. They are everywhere. A horrifying reminder of 18 workers who jumped from the buildings here at Foxconn City in the past few years. The suicide rate in this massive company is lower than average in China, but after people jumped in such a sobering cluster, Foxconn opened a counseling center and raised starting wages about 25 cents an hour. Like Zhao Xiaoying can't afford to live with their own children, much less buy one of the products they help build. While she carves thousands of Apple logos onto the backs of iPads every shift, she's never actually seen a working iPad. What do you want the people who end up buying this to know about you? I want them to know me, she says. I want them to know we put a lot of effort into this product and when they use it, please. Many people believe that the anti-globalization movement began with the World Trade Organization protests of 1999. However, there are others that assert that the movement can be traced as far back as 500 years with their resistance against European, European colonialism and U.S. imperialism. Of the most modern encounters, some commentators on the movement claim that it is merely a continuation of the anti-Vietnam War mobilizations of the 1960s and 1970s, the world rise, worldwide uprisings in 1968, and with the protests against structural adjustment in Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the 1980s and 1990s. Yet, despite the vague origins of this movement, it is most its most critical achievement thus far has put it in the global spotlight are, are the WTO pro protests held in Seattle, Washington on 1999, the IMF and World Bank protests held in Washington, D.C. and Prague in the year 2000, and the G8 protest held in Italy in 2001. While opposing neoliberalism, the anti-globalization movement advocates participatory democracy, seeking to, seeking to increase popular control of political and economic life in the face of increasingly powerful corporations, unaccountable global financial institutions, and U.S. hegemony. The anti-globalization movement did not actually begin in the U.S. Many cite the Zapatista movement which began in the rural town of Chiapas, Mexico, as a great influence to the movement. Another example of the anti-globalization movement being part of a larger connected global movement include the country of Bolivia, where many indigenous people stood their ground and said no to the export of gas and other natural resources, no to the free trade with the United States, no to the globalization in any form other than solidarity among the downtrodden peoples of the developing world. 
The globalization movement has staged several mass protests against the creation of the free trade area of the Americas. In April 2001, tens of thousands rallied outside the summit of the Americas in Quebec City, Canada. The aims of the movement include democracy, justice, and the realization of human rights on a global scale, where their general objectives as the movement itself was decentralized with the basis of combating neoliberal infestation of social problems. So far, talks have given legitimacy and airtime to the world's governments. Now it's the people's turn, because certain developed countries don't understand that we're heading for disaster. Some priorities are to draft a declaration of Mother Earth's rights, create an international tribunal for environmental justice, and highlight the value of indigenous people's ways. We've been asking for years for changes to the current system, to industrial development and to people's lifestyles. Because at this rate, our future on the planet is not at all secure. The most important message? Help for the climate needs to come fast. It's, it's like you are underwater with an oxygen tank and you say, okay, let me think how much oxygen I can leak and see if it's okay. <laughs> but that's what we are doing in effect. Right? We are playing with our oxygen tank. A major goal of the conference is to refine a proposal that Bolivian President Evo Morales took to the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen. By doing so, activists hope to avoid the disappointing outcome of that meeting and effect a real change when talks resume in Mexico at year's end. Social, political and economic conditions at the time of this movement include corporations becoming dominant and spanning multiple countries, thereby increasing globalization. The creation and implementation of NAFTA in 1994, allowing free commerce between the US, Mexico and Canada. It has also led to the offshoring of jobs from the United States to Mexico, worker exploitation in Asian sweatshops, and even the proliferation of Starbucks coffee shops across America, forcing millions to take a second look at globalization and its potential downside. Thus, globalization begat anti-globalization. With regards to criticism on the movement, it experienced somewhat of a backlash, losing its momentum it had gained from the 90s after the 9-11 attacks. Besides this, there has not been any negative criticism on the movement as a whole. A cultural impact is that of technology such as the social media <clears throat> and its role in social movements such as the Black Lives Matter and the currently held Paris Climate Conference. Thank you for holding this important hearing on globalization. Uh, there is a whole lot of debate. Uh, I am not as optimistic about the future in terms of the global economy as some of my colleagues. Uh, I would quote an article that appeared uh, some months ago in the New York Times. Uh, it said, and I quote, for much of the world, the magic of the marketplace extolled by the West in the afterglow of victory in the Cold War has been supplanted by the cruelty of markets, wariness toward capitalism, and new dangers of instability. End of quote. A couple of months ago, Business Week editorialized, quote, the austerity policies forced upon countries by the IMF in return for loans transform bad debt problems into economic debacles. The, the austerity policies of the IMF and the U.S. Treasury aren't part of the solution. They are part of the problem. If you look at what is happening in the world today, we should pay attention to what the World Bank is telling us. For example, the World Bank says that, uh, that uh, people living on less than a dollar a year, the number of people living on less than a dollar a year has risen from a billion dollars a few years ago to about 1.3 billion today. Uh, and would probably reach 1.5 billion by the year 2000. So we're seeing a significant increase among some of the very poorest people in the world. In Eastern Europe, in the former Soviet Union, the World Bank calculated that the number of people who are living under the poverty line of $4 a day has grown from 14 million in 1989 to 147 million today. That is not good news. What some of us have done, and I, my office has uh, been working with uh, economists, uh, NGOs, people in the trade union movement, and we have developed an alternative approach to the world uh, architecture. And let me talk a little bit about some of the aspects of that that will be part of legislation that I will soon be introducing. 
our concern for the uh, global economy that we want in the future is based on labor and human rights, protection of the environment, and new initiatives to encourage socially and environmentally sound national and local development. In other words, our goal is to protect the poorest people, the working people, the environment, and not just necessarily the large banks and financial institutions that have been making huge sums of money in recent years and in the process causing massive harm all over the world. What we are proposing, following the leads of finance ministers in Germany and Japan, we are calling for tighter controls on currency movements and international cooperation to manage exchange rates. We are following the initiative of the labor and human rights movements worldwide. We are calling for enforceable human rights, including labor, social, and economic rights, as fundamental principles embodied in trade agreements. Following the call of religious groups around the world, we are calling for the canceling of the debt of the world's poorest countries. Following the proposals of the environmental movement worldwide, we are calling for an end to the funding of environmentally destructive projects by the World Bank and IMF and channeling global investment funds into sustainable development that strengthens the economies of local communities. Following the work of groups concerned with poverty in the third world, we are calling for the termination of the IMF's mission creep and limiting the IMF to its original mandate of contributing to the promotion and maintenance of high levels of employment, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, I think the time has come to raise some fundamental questions about the nature of the global architecture that this country has helped develop. It has caused massive economic problems for the poorest people and for the environment. And I am very concerned about the kinds of volatility that we're seeing. And if people think that what happened in Asia, what happened in Mexico, what has happened in Russia uh, is just going to pass by when you have all of this flow of capital up and down, I think we are making a very sorry mistake. And I think we really to need to thoroughly reexamine what we are doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the more serious part of the discussion after the testimony, but I just want to take this minute to join with those.